Brace yourselves, we're likely to dive into some stereotypes. However they arise, they might stay for a reason. France, Scotland, England and those Nordic nations. Yes, we are within the realm of Vikings. Visiting York and Edinburgh. I should perhaps include a triptych. We're significant in the story of Albion, the Isle of Angles. Perhaps Brixham in the south of England in Devon. But that would give me scope to digress hugely. Let's try and keep some structure. That can boing into your notifications another time. We've been friends for a long, long time. We've shared again and again. Vivier Alliance. The old alliance. The old alliance. France and Scotland. I'm not talking Six Nations rugby, I'm talking 1295. Today, much of the Scottish coast has 25% Nordic ancestry and the islands, but the inlands and the highlands of Ireland and Scotland weren't really penetrated by the Vikings quite the same. When you think of a Scottish Highlander, ginger wig and tartan of a football supporter costume come to mind, don't they? Don't they? We'll come to that later. For the Vikings, York proved a much more fruitful base to invade and raid. England, the riper fruit. It was those very Vikings that Harold was trying to stem the flow of in 1066 when he was caught away south again from Stamford Bridge to Hastings. Less successful then, but the French were hardly more than Vikings at that stage. They'd been taken by the coast and assimilated. The part French, part Viking, William, the conqueror of England, and the French that he'd left behind, soon against each other again, and while the whole of the known Western world were combining to unite as crusaders to the Arabian Middle East, still fighting against themselves alliance between Scotland and France, and if England invaded either. Scotland had a seven-year-old Queen Margaret, maid of Norway. She died. The Council of Twelve took over and formed the alliance with France, with Edward I threatening her. This Treaty of Paris lasted for centuries, repeatedly signed every year. Scots were often brought in as mercenaries from the French. There is some genetic evidence to suggest that gingers feel less pain as well as absorbing vitamin D. 10% of the population now. Don't forget that the Vikings penetrated way on down south into the Mediterranean of Turkey. So the ginger gene mutation will have spread. We like the same clothes and we like the same wine. And we have similar taste in men. The 1500s, the Catholic Inquisition, brought another bond against the English with the two north and south border nations of the England of Protestant tendencies. Le Garde Écossaise, the Scottish Guards, were the bodyguards of the French monarchy, um, like 24 or 100, at one point including Joan of Arc in them. That personal bodyguard in the of centuries. France could have helped Robert the Bruce a bit better. But this alliance might partly have contributed towards the uh, British love of supporting the underdog themselves. Now we found one man, and we can share him too. For I will love him first, and what is left, I give to you. Throughout the 1200 to 1500 period, half of France to the west, from Normandy, Brittany, Bordeaux, is the main point, all the way down to the Pyrenees, was British under the Angevin free trade area. Might be worthwhile as a bit of context in the Scottish-French camaraderie concept. I'm mixing British and English there, aren't I? Brought about through marriage, the Angevin Empire included half of Ireland, eastern half of Ireland. Didn't include Wales, didn't include Scotland either. That his eyes are the colour of the sea. A dozen countries in the crusading era lay claim to St George, 
It's not an English claim. He may have been a corrupt bacon supplier to the Roman army, who later became Archbishop of Alexandria. What the bacon was, if it wasn't bacon, perhaps human flesh of your haunch. St George claimed by a dozen nations, but quite a proletariat patronage of tradesmen. Only a moi means you tell him after me, after me, after me. Cornwall and Brittany, those two peninsulas that reach out towards each other, has got Guernsey and Jersey nearby. In the 1500s, books make record of Catherine Corches burned at the stake with her two daughters at St Peter's Port. The account reads how while being burnt with her, one of the two daughters' pregnant belly exploded. Out popped a newborn baby, carried clear of the flames by the force of the explosion, only to be taken from the crowd of onlookers and thrown back into the fire by a bailiff. The child was both born and died a martyr, leaving behind to the world, which it never saw, a spectacle wherein the whole world can see the cruelty and graceless generation of popish tormentors in their perpetual shame and infamy of the people of that period. You can hold him till he melts like the sugar in your tea. Sticking with the perennial southern front, France did invade Britain in the 1700s from the little port between Brest and Quimper. While Napoleon was having his successes off east, the directorate decided that Bristolians, Britain's second city, would be impressed, always having a slightly revolutionary spirit. And with some rather second-rate seized brandy, the currency of the time, and Bristolians do like brandy, the 1500 French convicts turned invaders were to be joined by a throng of locals and march north and claim territories. But it was again weather that caused problems for the two battleships and they couldn't land in Bristol in the Severn, so they sailed to Pembrokeshire. Fishguard was where they invaded. Not even Fishguard, really, a beach down the road. These newly enlisted prisoners uh, let themselves loose on the town and partied for a few days. Some local Welsh women in their traditional red skirts and top black hats watched this invasion from a safe distance. They understood... Jemima the Great had rounded up 14 of them and put them in a church with a pitchfork, but these Welsh women, watching from a distance, were mistaken for English redcoats, and the convicts surrendered after looting and consuming all that the local looters and pirates had pillaged away from Portuguese grinder chips. This invasion was an Irish-American uh, invention, uh, a Tate. If you wish suggest you watch me closely while I woo. By all accounts, Dick Turpin, the highwayman, was causing more trouble up north, in York. A homegrown hero. I have kissed him. Did you hear how he whispered, ooh la la? Do you really think he will kiss you? The English did, of course, invade France in that medieval period before. Um, we all love the story of Agincourt, the two-fingered salute. You're going to get your fingers cut off. Taunt. The British were down in the valley between two hills, and it was all looking doomed in small numbers. The French had huge numbers, but the archers, the British archers, won the day. They rained down so many arrows, easily firing uphill, taking out... Three dukes, 1,500 knights, and 5,000 men at arms. With impunity as they rained down, it was what happened afterwards. A great victory. The English decided they were in no position to take prisoners, so the thousands of prisoners of war were murdered. They didn't just cut off their fingers. They were an invading army, weren't they? They could be surrounded by French reinforcements at any time. I have kissed him. Did you hear how he whispered... 
Scottish French alliance was perhaps most useful in keeping the Scottish barons at bay and keeping a Scottish monarchy lucid. Much the same as the War of the Holy League in Italy, the old alliance didn't do much when it came to the combo of royal marriage and invasion, the rough wooing of the border countries. It didn't do much for the outcome of the Battle of Creasy. York, those former Vikings, were dominant in the War of the Roses, with Lancashire retreating to Scotland. The slow creep of dour Scottish Protestants is perhaps the most decisive. Do you really think he will kiss you? Après moi, après moi, après moi. Repercussions still causing so much tr- strife now. The War of the Three Kingdoms, England, Scotland, Ireland. Cromwell just really needed to stop the threats of rent mob Mercenaries North and West. Pseudo-French Bonnie Prince Charlie. Culloden and the Highland Clearances. Ruthless English. The Crows, if they ever leave the Tower of London, is just an epitaph of how ruthlessness works for the English. Skipping on ahead much more recently, there has been a British invasion of the Alps since the days of Thomas Cook. That usurped by the home team of Brexit. The scouts themselves are always a bit dodgy in my mind, a bit like the Hitler Youth, intent organisation wise. But it's the ging gang, gooly gooly gooly, hela, hela, shela that bothers me as well. It's a bit like a warning, a foreboding, a bit like a ring a ring the roses type story. Ginga, what's the ginga in it? Australia had been discovered by then, the gooly possibly, rather than the trousers content. Hela. Sheila Shayla Al oh. Shalali is a Celtic club like weapon. I don't really want to join the jock dots for you, but it's not a gibberish or gobbledygook. It's a series of racist and elitist slurs. Set your enemies against each other, good chance. Ginga is to ginger what Jippo is to gypsy. What any R is to O. If you wish to learn this too. I suggest you watch me closely while I won't. Ginger isn't defined as a racial group, but why does the whole world think that all gingers come from Scotland, from the Highlands particularly? Why are there so many gingers in Scotland from Scotland? Après moi, après. Oh well, I really didn't like him anyway. Migration from the civilization of the Golden Crescent northwards with the shrinking of the last ice age. The further north you go, the better the selective conditions are for very pale skinned people needing lots of vitamin D to predominate, and there's going to be a larger percentage of ginger haired people amongst them. It does tend to fade to a ready auburn as people get older. But the bright luminous of a fine young mane is attractive. Especially a bit of colour in the muddy environment of grouse and gorse, moss, peat and bog, bracken and moor. Yes, we're talking about hereditary features, not the slang for juice, fizzy drinks. Like Iron Brew, the institution that it is. Caledonian scientists have looked into this trait more than most. MC1R is needed, but not the be-all and end-all. That's one of eight genes. Considered a bit like albinoism in some parts of the world, but it is well above the global average in England, Iceland, Norway, Germany, Sweden, Finland, Netherlands, northern France, and, of course, Scotland. And Ireland. Brown, green or hazel eyes as well. Blue eyes more rarely. The hair is said to fade to rose gold and then to white eventually, rather than grey. This MC1R started about 10,000 or 20,000 years ago, though. Neanderthals had it. I think that was interbreeding with humans and 
pale skin, producing more vitamin D. In a northerly environment with very little sunshine, avoids rickets and combined with meagre nutrition, not getting rickets and bending of the bones in infancy is an obvious genetic environmental advantage. Since Greek times there was a slave trade from northern latitudes by sea to the Mediterranean and eastwards by sea into northern Russia but that just might be the Vikings why there's so many in Russia. But only 2% of the world's population, less than, is redhead. A real rarity and value. Henna and saffron are used to emulate it. Are redheads of a more sanguine, pitter temperament? Are they more fiery, libidinous and mischievous? Are a far higher percentage of lustful criminal women redhead? The Red-Headed League, a Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes story, I won't spoil the plot for you, but they are getting organised. There's meetups in America and Russia. James Bonds are often Scottish orphans, borderline gingers, aren't they? So Tom Hardy isn't likely to be uncovering the next global conspiracy on that score. Pre-Second World War, studies put Jewish European population as 10% redhead. And in Central Europe, red hair had been an identifier for persecutions of Jewish persons, perhaps before people were too squeamish to check if they were circumcised or not. You do get red-haired, blue-eyed Chinese. The ruddy mystery continues, my dear. Darling, je vous aime beaucoup, je ne sais pas what to do, vous avez completely stolen my heart. Matin, midi, et le soir, toujours wondering how you are, that's the way I felt. So, we're in York. Ecclesiastical Enlightenment and Wealth, Stone Age Viking and Dick Turpin Highwayman. Edinburgh, the Athens of the North, only became a hotbed of genius and enlightenment in the 1800s after a profiting from the international slave trade and starving and banishing its own peoples after becoming its capital. What was left of clans congregated peaceably in Athens City. No, there's a devolved Scottish Parliament and a de facto referendum with no real power because the English have to approve it. Plenty of theatre and festivals. Tron Kirk gave rise to Hogmanay Street Party. Burning of the Viking longship in New Year celebrations. Beltane fertility celebrations. How do you celebrate your fertility? I can see your questioning. You walk up a hill. Obviously not in pagan times, but under the cover of a blanket. Wish my friend was good enough. I'd tell you so much more. Scottish independence struggle is much more civilised than it used to be. There's voting and courts and things now. When Brexit started getting going, Yorkshire independence started raising its head culturally. I can sort of see it, but more linked with Northumberland as a, as a ex-Viking thing. That dividing there is a north-south divide of Britain, where Celtic fringes of Wales and Cornwall that has its own independence movement, and then further up a little bit, Wessex and Mercia off to the east. Wales has a devolved parliament, Yorkshire wants a devolved parliament. <sighs> Cornwall, there's so much of London in it now. Couldn't just London have Brexited away from Europe and left the rest of us with Europe? No, the city of London wouldn't like that.
they probably like the burning the old lady and her two daughters and the pregnant child popping out and then throwing it back into the fire. And the city of London might have gone for that. It's sort of a good graphic representation of financial strategy. Sadly, I don't think Cornish independence is taken too seriously. They're too busy milking the rest of us. But when you look at statistical graphs for things, Britain is still divided into the Mercia, Wessex, Celtic, Fringes, North, um, Scottish, and America has never wanted us and certainly doesn't need us. It's got Ireland. It's Emerald Jaw. Wish my friend was good enough. Ireland to Each of these regions has its own culture. I'm sure the capital of Scotland isn't the real Scotland, just as most of England thinks of London as a mad hole. Are my Scottish rolled porridge oats really Scottish and why are they associated with Scotland? My Christmas shortbread biscuits, why are they associated with Scotland? Men in skirts, the tartan, the sporran, the lack of underwear. You want to take me cruising on an ocean liner to places I long to see? Is it only really for the tourist? The York independence movement is looking to have Harry Potter as its king. He's leaving from platform 13 and three quarters up to here, get coronated in York Minster. Well, a lot of people do. I don't think you go to York for Harry Potter tourism. You go for the stained glass window in York Minster alone, the largest in Europe. We're all a bit blasé really, about what glass means, what glass has brought enlightenment and civilization, beauty and delight. Stained glass is a mosaic of tiny little pieces, but amazing. You might go to Scotland for the marshmallow world of the winter, but you don't go for skiing. I'm sorry, you can, but you don't. When it comes to food in Scotland, I have seen deep fried Mars bars in the fish and chip shop listing. They do them in French for you. How many tourists have been told that a haggis is a little bird that flies around and the hunters shoot it out the sky on their gentleman shooting parties? That's a grouse. A haggis isn't a small flightless bird. Interestingly, the Scottish do rather like turnips. The French eat turnips. English feed them to their horses and eat parsnips. And France parsnips are fed to the horses. Mashed potato and whiskey sauce with your, I guess, I think. A tatty is a potato. So a tatty scone. It's like a little patty of fried potato. And usually in Britain it's sort of leftover. I'm stopping myself because I've said Britain again. England, it's uh, leftovers from yesterday. Potato with vegetables mixed up in it. And bubble and squeak is fried up and had with your evening meal. Bubble and squeak's good at any time of day. I don't really know what a hash brown is, but that sort of commercial version. I always thought hash brown was something that you smoked. Fudge. To fudge something is to mess something up or gloss over something. Not like a bad repair, but um, anywhere where they do clotted cream and good dairy products, you'll get fudge as a tourist treat. Um, Scotland's version is a bit rougher. A tablet, they call it. I thought I'd do my YouTube on it. I like to think that a lawn sausage is where the hamburger came from. Lawn sausage, not sausage shapes, just a flat patty. Eckle feckle, eckle fecken, 
tart is a touristy walnut and raisin and other dried fruits creation, a bit like a mince pie. Cinnamon spices, you might get a bit of whiskey in there. A bit like a blackburn or fruitcake. A lot of cultures get protective of the same thing by a different name. What your mother called it. Think brioche um, croissants, and you've pretty much got a buttery or a brownie. Our breath smokies and stored away black pudding may well have a origin protected status by now. Oh, but that weak teaser. Um, the Romans introduced oats to Scotland. It was one of the few things that took well to the soils and the climate. The Hadrian's War is always seen as a barrier to the Roman Empire to keep out the Scots, but the technologists of the Roman Empire showed the natives how to do this. Started a little border empire and didn't need to administrative it. It could do it itself and rip them off on the trading. Do you think Romans have concerned themselves with fair trade policies? Only the wealthiest of Londonia mers do. While in England you might get black pudding, a blood sausage slice with your full English breakfast we're talking, alongside your fried tomatoes and mushrooms. The Scottish can only afford streaky bacon with that. We tend to prefer back bacon in Britain. England. There is a Scottish language. When I was a bairn, a child, the Welsh language was pretty much extinct. Thriving there. Um, and the Scottish language died a death a century ago. It's sort of been reconstructed, but when you read about Cullen Skink, it's not even like a Manx kipper. It's a thick, creamy, smoked haddock soup. Neeps and tatties is more like a slang. It's pretty much the same as Scottish. Angus beef and bean. There's that home on the range there, from Montana to Texas. A ship's biscuit in the Royal British Navy is a pretty unpalatable salty, stale, hard affair that needed soaking. A biscuit? Biscuits now are little treats, aren't they? Shortbread, a biscuit? Oh, that was short. Quite is, really. Shortbread is considered Scottish because Queen Anne had her cooks develop a French recipe, probably throwing loads of sugar at it. That reminds me of the weirdest thing about porridge in Scotland. You can end up with it salty if you're not careful. Salty porridge, it's always got like jam or honey in it, isn't it? For breakfast, anyway. But salty porridge was the thing. You're not Scottish unless you're eating salty porridge because it keeps, you cook it, the oats don't rot. Cakes, you can have it for a week if it's salted and cooked. Oat cakes, a um, substitute for bread, perhaps it's like the worst biscuit. An oaty cracker, no, it's not a rice cake, but oats are one of the few crops that grow in the north of Scotland. A mutton pie, if you can find it, go for it. Now, haggis has a nutty texture. Sheep's heart, lungs, liver, a bit of oatmeal, onions, suet, and spices. Baked in the animal's stomach. Neeps and tatties. Neeps being root vegetables <laughs> other than potatoes. Stovies is obviously a very potatoy stew. Scottish is sounding rather more like a slang than a language, isn't it? But it is, apparently. When they're speaking English, you have to train so They lived there for about it. two years before eventually right, they gave themselves up, nice, claiming that they couldn't eat Get any more cooked, seagulls. Right. Watch for the shot. Ruin your teeth. Angus beef, yes, always, and with some of the freshest water in the world, salmon, smoked salmon, salmon without being smoked, everything salmon is beautiful. And finish off one of those three with a cracker. I'll leave you to find out what that is because my mouth's going to start watering. It's a fruity mousse type thing in layers. Or a tannock's tea cake. You can stick with sticky toffee pudding as far as I'm concerned. I will give an honourable mention to a cock a leaky soup. Leeks aren't just for the Welsh. Cock isn't just for the French. And stick some prunes in it. Fruit and savoury is always good. Griddle bake of unleavened buttermilk balm. Not really too much to shout about. An almond studded dum dee cake. <laughs> Take it or leave it. Now, the origin of the scone. That thing that you have your cream and jam on, or is it jam and cream? Seems so quintessentially English to me.
I have it with my tea. Well stewed. Milk, not lemon. But if a scone is named after a schoenbrod Dutch word, and named in their own mind after the stone of destiny where the kings of Scotland were anointed, I'm going to be heartbroken. My Devon scone is cultural appropriation from a colonial overlording. Let's leave it there for today.